Okay, so welcome everyone to our CBBC seminar. Um, we're very lucky today to have um, Chelsea Bartram from the University of Washington. Um, so Chelsea got her, her PhD from uh, the University of North Carolina, working on um, the positronium experiment to, to, to the CPT violation. Um, she's now um, become a part of the ADMX experiment. So that's the Axion Dark Matter experiment, which is uh, one of the most famous searches for, for Axion Dark Matter. Um, so thank you very much, Chelsea, for, for being with us and, um, and I'll, I'll give you the floor. Great, thanks so much um, for that introduction. Um, as Karen said, my name is Chelsea Bartram. I'm a postdoc working at the University of Washington. Um, I work specifically in a lab that's called SEMPA, um, which is the Center for Experimental Nuclear Physics and Astrophysics. Um, and the title uh, of my talk, which I'm here to give today, is called Matter Matter Everywhere, But Not Enough, We Think. And I will explain that in the forthcoming slides. Um, but it uh, matches with the theme of the background here, which is the Puget Sound in Seattle. Okay. Um, so what do I mean by this? Um, I'm referencing essentially the fact that our um, understanding of the dark matter composition of, or of the matter composition of the universe is that 4% uh, of the matter is uh, visible and, um, or sorry, uh, about 4% uh, of the energy content of the universe is visible, um, whereas 25% uh, uh, is within the form of what's known as dark matter. Um, dark matter makes up actually 85% of the known uh, matter content of the universe. And um, we uh, know this from an abundance of astrophysical evidence, um, but our uh, indirect observations uh, basically um, give us some in insight as to the nature of this uh, particle. So we know, for example, that dark matter is concentrated near galaxies. We know that it interacts via gravity, although it is unclear if there are other interactions. We know that it is cold, that is to say non-relativistic. Um, we know that it is feebly interacting as well as very stable and non-baryonic. Um, so I, as I stated before, there's an abundance of evidence that points to the existence of dark matter. Um, some of these, uh, to name a few, are um, listed on the left-hand side. And uh, the first one that I'd like to note is the uh, existence of um, these discrepancies in the galactic rotation curves. Um, this was sort of first indicated by Fritz Zwicky, but later, um, confirmed by uh, Vera Rubin. Uh, when she measured the galactic rotation curves, um, she made the observation that uh, they didn't really quite match up what was predicted if the um, only constituent of uh, matter constituent was visible matter. Um, and in order to account for the discrepancy, um, you had to basically add this missing matter, which is the dark matter. Um, there are these other uh, pieces of evidence that kind of build the, a bigger picture. Um, we know, for example, gravitational lensing, lensing um, points to the existence of dark matter, as well as primordial matter fluctuations, baryon acoustic oscillations, matter radiation fluctuations, galaxy cluster collisions, as shown here. Here's the coma cluster, um, as well as primordial nu nucleosynthesis and the cosmic microwave background, uh, of which we have this better picture of from the Planck CMB in 2013. So I'm in particular interested in what's known as the axion, which is one uh, dark matter candidate. And I think the axion is especially interesting because it actually solves two problems at once. So it solves the problem of the question of what is dark matter, but it also can solve what's known as the strong CP problem. And I'll explain uh, here what that problem exactly is. So we know that strong interactions should violate CP or charge parity due to this term that appears in the QCD Lagrangian. And we also know that um, basically uh, this means that CP violation um, should exist in strong interactions and we should be able to measure that um, via a neutron electric dipole moment. So if you look at this plot starting back before the 1960s, we were looking for such a dipole moment. And uh, with every uh, search we've done, we've, uh, we have turned up uh, with nothing. And so after many years of searching, we are still without a neutron EDM in fact, we've been able to set a limit that is uh, quite low. You can see it's on the order of 10 to the minus 26 electron centimeters. And so this absence of a neutron electric EDM, uh, sorry, a neutron EDM um, 
is uh, problematic given this term the QCD Lagrangian. And so um, here's where the uh, axion dark matter particle enters. And so basically there were these two theorists, um, Roberto Pecci and Helen Quinn, who proposed the solution to the strong CP problem. And what they did was they upgraded this theta term here to become a dynamical variable, which relaxes to zero at some critical temperature. And ultimately, um, Wilczek um, and some other theorists predicted that this uh, basically um, made the observation that this predicted a pseudoscalar boson, which is known as the axion. And so in particular, I'm interested in what's known as the QCD axion. And the QCD axion is the axion that solves the strong CP problem. Um, I'll just note that there are actually a variety of other axions, but the QCD axion is uh, unique in this regard. Um, axions are a subset of what is known as wave-like dark matter. I'll explain more what that means in a bit. Um, and the QCD axion is interesting because with a mass range between one and 100 micro EV, um, it can constitute the entirety of dark matter. Um, this QCD axion actually comes in sort of two classes of models. So first there's the KFVZ um, class, which couples to quarks, and you can characterize it by its G gamma value, which typically uh, we use G gamma equals minus 0.97. And then there's this DFSC um, class, which couples to quarks and leptons. And um, for that class, we typically use this G gamma value equal to 0.36. Now, um, one thing you might notice is if you look at the absolute value of this coupling term, this one is much smaller. And while it may not seem like a, a great deal, um, it actually corresponds to um, needing 50 times longer integration time to be sensitive to a DFSC axion as opposed to a KFS, KSVZ axion. And so this is um, particularly interesting because my experiment, the axion dark matter experiment, has actually hit this benchmark. And so we uh, are the only experiment that has been sensitive to DFSC axions up to this point. And so um, I just want to point out that the theoretical constraints for axions is actually quite wide, even though I'm just focusing on the QCD axion for this talk. Um, but the ultimate lower bound on um, any axion-like particle is basically set by the size of the dark matter um, halo uh, for dwarf galaxies. And so um, you basically don't want a wavelength that's larger than the size of the galaxy. So that's 10 to the minus 22 EV. And then the upper bound is set by the supernova 1987A and white dwarf cooling time. Um, so I'm interested particularly in this QCD axion, which in the most vanilla of post, um, post-inflationary models is in this uh, 10 to the minus 6 EV range. So um, you may be wondering, I mentioned briefly before, what, what do I mean by uh, wave-like dark matter? And uh, what this means is that the axion field can actually be written um, in terms of this cosine term, where the axion mass um, is actually the frequency of oscillation. And then the amplitude uh, goes like this square root of 2 times the dark matter density over the axion mass. Um, and if you calculate the de Broglie wavelength of the axion, you end up with something that's on the order of hundreds of meters for the typical axions we're searching for with my experiment. Um, and this is actually quite large. So this is uh, not what we're typically used to dealing with in terms of uh, particle physics experiments. Um, so you'll notice um, also that if you look, um, that, so the axion can convert to a photon in a magnetic field. And so what this means is that the corresponding wavelength of that conversion photon is on the scale of, say, meters. And so initially, um, this made people think that the axion was virtually impossible to detect um, until this guy here in the corner, Pierce Hebe came along. And he said the axion um, had just been declared invisible. And here he is quoted in this IEEE article. Let me just calculate how invisible they truly are. So he was the first person to kind of um, come up with a a robust idea for detecting these axions. And I'll get to that uh, in a bit, but I first want to explain that the field now is much broader and there are actually multiple ways of getting at an axion detection. Um, I'll emphasize that this axion to photon coupling, um, that is to say the axion converting to a photon in a magnetic field is by far the most prolific means of trying to do an axion search. So you can see there's a number of experiments listed here um, 
within this category, you see that there are helioscopes with which look at the sun. Uh, there are these haloscopes, like my experiment, I'll explain later. Um, and then there are kind of these um, higher frequency axion searches and lower frequency axion searches that have all kind of joined in the past couple of decades. Um, but you can also use other cu axion couplings to do searches, and some of these are more recent. So, for example, there's an experiment that is using the coupling to the nucleon EDM, uh, coupling to the axion nuclear moment, and then there's also searches that use the coupling to the axial electric moment. Um, but on the whole, um, if we look at the axion photon coupling, um, because of the nature of this uh, conversion to this very low energy photon, um, you end up needing a wide array of tools that are sort of different from your typical toolbox if you're an experimental particle physicist. Um, so these uh, technologies involve fields such as quantum computing, cryogenics, um, high magnetic fields, as well as microwave electronics. And so I find this particularly interesting aspect of um, my experiment in my current field. So, um, okay, how do we actually detect the axions using this coupling? Um, well, the idea that Pierre Sikidi proposed was to use a resonant cavity axion heloscope, which used this so-called inverse prim Primakov effect. That is to say the axion comes into a strong magnetic field. It interacts in the field to produce this conversion photon and then you detect that with your detec detector. And the detector that Sakivi proposed was basically this microwave cavity connected to an ultra low noise receiver chain. And if you have a very high quality factor uh, for your cavity, then you have a very um, high chance of detecting the axion to photon conversion because you're basically maximizing the number of bounces um, that the uh, <coughs> um, that the axion would have. And so um, ultimately, this is uh, sort of the key factor in your experiment. And then also, um, if you scale your cavity correctly, you can achieve a high overlap of the static magnetic and the axion electric fields. And this ultimately um, enables you to get it a high enough power signal out. So you want to maximize what we call the form factor, which represents this overlap. And you can see we can compute that using this uh, this equation right here. And so in this picture, red is the cartoon magnetic field and blue is the cartoon electric field. So you want them maximally um, aligned to get your maximum axion power. Um, and I, sh I should mention that that only happens for certain modes in the um, cavity. And so the resonant cavity heloscope that we use um, ends up looking sort of like this. Now, this is a cartoon version, obviously. But, um, and the way it works is that an axion will come in, interact in your magnetic field, uh, deposit this photon, which is then registered as an excess energy uh, in your detector. Uh, that power is then read out via uh, this antenna, which is, um, and the signal is then amplified before being digitized and Fourier transformed to generate a power spectrum. So this is an example of what that power spectrum might look like in the event of an axion. And I just want to emphasize that this line shape has been greatly exaggerated. So in reality, in an unprocessed scan, you wouldn't be able to see this very tall peak. Um, but this just emphasizes why you need a very cold experiment and also an ultra low noise receiver chain, because the noise um, has to be mitigated as much as possible in order to see the signal. Um, and so uh, I want to point out also that, of course, we don't know the mass of the axion. And so this means that your resonator must be tunable. And so we have this tuning rod, and this enables us to scan over a wide variety of axion masses and really exclude a, a larger um, amount of the parameter space than we would if we did not have that. And so um, the experiment uh, collaboration that I'm a part of is called the Axion Dark Matter Experiment, or ADMX. Um, we are using this technique of having an extremely sensitive AM receiver attached to a microwave resonator in a magnetic field. Um, as I said before, we're the only haloscope sensitive to DFSC axions. We are one of three uh, so-called Gen 2 dark matter projects funded by the DOE. And currently we consist of 11 different institutions, all of which listed here. And I'll just point out that uh, Western Australia has recently joined our group, so that's quite exciting. 
Now, um, what does ADMX actually look like? Well, I've put this photograph of what we call the insert. So this is uh, basically the cavity and the ultra low noise receiver chain. And I've um, positioned it next to a cartoon cutaway of the experiment so you can get a sense of what's inside. And I'd like to start at the very bottom. So here you have your actual microwave cavity where the axion uh, power would be deposited. And this is immersed, of course, in your very strong, in our case, eight Tesla magnetic field. So this is generated by a superconducting magnet. Um, this is at the coldest temperature stage of the experiment, which is created by a dilution refrigerator. So typically around the 100 millikelvin uh, level. As you proceed upward through the experiment, you um, reach this region here, which is shown in dotted red. And this is where we keep our so-called quantum electronics. So um, in order for this experiment to work, we need ultra low noise amplifiers. And it just so happens that a quantum amplifier known as a JPA uh, does the trick. So unfortunately, this amplifier is very sensitive to magnetic fields, so we have to protect it. And we do so by um, using what's called a bucking coil or a field cancellation coil in this region. So this actively cancels out the uh, magnetic field that is due to the main magnet. And it uh, protects this amplifier, um, amplifier uh, package that we have in the center of the detector. So um, once the signals get amplified there, they then proceed out the top of the uh, experiment up into the room temperature region and go to our uh, electronics rack. And so you can see uh, the electronics rack is in this direction. And this is just showing that same picture, but next to a schematic of all the internals, uh, microwave uh, electronics inside of this experiment. And I just want to uh, mention a few things here. Um, this particular schematic is designed so that we can continuously uh, characterize our experiment. So we can do things uh, such as measure the transmission through the cavity by putting power in this port and measuring it on the output line. We can measure what's called the reflection um, measurement by putting power in on a so-called bypass line and bouncing it off the top. This tells us about how well our antenna is coupled. And then finally, we can also perform noise studies with this schematic. So we can um, flip this switch here to look at this attenuator and heat the attenuator and look at the power spectra coming out. We, if we have a good understanding of our receiver chain, we can actually perform a fit to that data and extract out our system noise. And our system noise is imperative to understanding our sensitivity. And so we do this operation um, every couple of months while we're taking data to ensure that we really understand what that is. And so when it's all put together, um, we uh, make sure that we uh, safely transport it into the magnet bore. And so this was essentially my first task as a postdoc was to commission the run 1C detector. So you can see I'm here pulling on the ropes and we're basically trying to get all of this into the magnet bore, this very narrow hole in the ground shown here. Um, and so that, that we can start cooling and start taking data. And so for run 1C, which is the current data taking run that I'm um, basically in charge of, uh, our target frequency range is from 780 to 1010 megahertz. Uh, this corresponds to an axion mass range of 3.2 to 4.2 micro EV. Um, we are, our goal is to continue at DFSC sensitivity, which um, has been the goal for the past two runs. Um, and we've made a variety of improvements in between these runs. So we think we have a better understanding of our amplifiers, better noise temperature, quality factor, um, as well as a number of other upgrades to the uh, electronics. Um, and you can see here, this is what we call a mode map. Um, so it shows the various cavity modes highlighted in light green as a function of the rod position. And so ultimately we want to track this TM010 mode because that one couples most strongly to the axion. If you recall the form factor equation that I showed before. And so once it's in a bore, it's basically like tuning a very fancy AM radio. And so you can see here, this is what we would um, look at on a network analyzer, you see these peaks represent the different um, uh, cavity modes, and we would track the lowest order mode, the TM010. And ultimately what that looks like is this, and I just want to mention it doesn't actually go this fast. Um, we wish it did, but um, you can see uh, the modes kind of shift as we tune, and we want to follow this one lowest order mode here. 
And sometimes the modes get very close and interact, and that's typically called a mode crossing, and we have to kind of finagle the detector at that point. But um, the goal is to cover this whole frequency range. Um, and on that note, um, we want to do it as fast as we can. And so it's important to understand what's known as the resonant halo scope scan rate. And so I've shown this long equation here, but I want to just focus on a few different parts of it. Um, we only have a few handles on this equation as experimentalists, and I've basically uh, highlighted those here. So um, these four terms, uh, the magnetic field, the volume, the quality factor, and the form factor, um, we can try to maximize those as best we can. We can build the experiment so we're using a strong magnetic field and a high volume, et cetera. Um, there are aspects of it we cannot control. I've listed those here, the dark matter density, the actual mass of the axion, et cetera. And then finally, we can minimize our system noise and that'll give us the fastest possible scan rate that we can achieve. Um, that said, I wanna mention there's a number of uh, system state measurements that we have to make for the experiment. And these ultimately contribute somewhat to our dead time. So even if we maximize the scan rate, we still have to perform these um, kind of sanity check measurements. So uh, some of these um, are necessary to achieve the best possible operating state. For example, we have to continually rebias our quantum amplifier. So the quantum amplifiers are only sensitive within a particular frequency range, so they have to be continuously adjusted. Um, we also want to make measurements of our transmission on our reflections um, scans, because this will tell us how good is our quality factor, as well as how well is our antenna coupled. Um, we also have this possibility of injecting synthetic axion signals, and I'll touch on that later in my talk. Um, the actual data taking happens in the digitization, and then we move the rods, recouple the antenna, and start the process all over again. So as a postdoc on this experiment, I actually came in and wrote many of these scripts that automated the full experiment. And now onto the analysis. So for ADMX, we actually have two different types of analysis, and I'm going to focus on the first one shown here, which is the medium res analysis. analysis. Um, the medium res analysis can detect a persistent axion signal, and it makes the assumption of an isothermal velocity distribution, and it has 100 hertz bin width spacing. So this is sort of optimized for this particular type of axion. There's also the high resolution um, analysis. And this can search for a much narrower peak, which would be due to discrete axion flow. It can detect annual and diurnal modulation of the axion if we actually found a candidate. And it has much higher resolution. So the best possible resolution we can get is, with it is 10 uh, millihertz. Um, but the medium resolution is sort of optimized for uh, what people in the community think the axion is most likely to be like. And um, the raw data basically looks like this. You can see a power spectrum here. And this is basically 10,000 of 10 millisecond subspectra co-added together at the level of the digitizer code. And it results in 100 seconds worth of data. So that's our integration time. Um, we then have to uh, proceed with a number of processing steps before we can actually search for axions in this. So I'll just touch on a few of those. Um, the first is we have to actually filter out the receiver shape. So um, both the warm electronics and the cold electronics receiver chains um, impose a particular shape on the raw spectrum. This is just due to the frequency dependence of various components. Um, the warm electronic shape remains fairly constant with time. So you can um, just measure that and divide it out. But the cold electronic shape uh, must be performed continuously and is somewhat uh, and is unknown because it's internal to the, um, the detector. And the reason it is changing is because the uh, quantum amplifier is frequency dependent. And so we remove it by performing what's known as a pod A fit. And this fits out large scale structures, but not narrow axion like peaks. And so you can see an example after all this filtering is performed shown here. We have this power um, spectrum centered around zero. We then have to account for what's known as the Lorentzian uh, cavity shape. So a real axion signal, because it would be deposited in the cavity, would follow this Lorentzian line shape. And so that uh, means we have to weight our bins accordingly. Um, 
I also just want to mention that this fact can also help us identify radio frequency interference as opposed to real axion signals. So any uh, radio frequency interference or RFI that enters downstream of the cavity wouldn't follow this particular shape. And so it's very helpful in terms of making data quality cuts. Um, and then I uh, finally want to mention that um, one more uh, filter that we apply basically uses um, what's known as the axion velocity distribution. And so we know that based off of our motion through the galaxy that the axion line shape has a particular shape, which I've shown here. This is known as the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. And um, actually, uh, to get into a little bit more detail, it has an annual and diurnal modulation, which comes from our rotational and orbital motion. Um, and we are not sensitive to this in the medium res analysis, but the high res analysis is. And so this can be um, very exciting. If we think we have an axion candidate, we can hand it off to our high res collaborators and they can probe this in more detail. Finally, uh, once we put this all together, we have to combine the raw spectra into what we call the grand power spectra. And we do this uh, via a procedure that gives us the best possible SNR. Um, and once they are, uh, uh, once these grand spectra are generated, we can then identify axion candidates. So this is what an example of what that would look like. And I just want to mention this is actually simulated data because we don't want to give away any candidates. <laughs> um, but uh, I worked to develop with a student um, what we call software injections, just to verify that we understand this whole analysis procedure. And um, what we do is we um, create basically fake axion signals um, in the software at the beginning of the analysis and look to see, check the grand spectra and see, um, did we detect all of them uh, or is there some reduction in the efficiency? And so you can see here an example of a grand spectra with no software injections and then adjacent to it is the spectra with the software injections. And so again, this helped us determine our detection efficiency and also pointed out ways we could mitigate um, any sensitivity reduction we had coming from the analysis itself. Um, so for example, some of our filtering processes were cutting into our detection efficiency. And so we can always work to improve those. Um, on the note of synthetic axions, I also wanna point out what we have um, a tool that we have called hardware synthetic axions. So this is the synthetic axion generator. And this basically generates a synthetic signal in the hardware itself. Um, so you can see if you're uh, on site looking at our electronics rack, there's this black um, closed box here. And this basically has an arbitrary waveform generator that makes this Maxwell Boltzmann type signal. And it mixes up to the frequency of the axion and sends it into the cavity. Um, so we made a number of improvements to that recently in between data taking runs. So I just listed a few of those here, but basically the takeaway is that now it's fully automated. So it wasn't hundred percent automated before. So now it's very nice. Um, and we have our collaborators, um, working on a blind injection scheme. So basically the people who are operating the experiment don't know if they're going to send in a fake axion signal or not. Um, and so this gives us a really robust understanding of our experiment and um, gives us, uh, uh, makes us much more confident in our results. Okay, so performing an axion search ultimately ends up becoming this decision tree. Um, and it's not, uh, it's not typical in the sense of your ordinary um, particle physics searches, um, wherein you collect the data and you kind of analyze it. In uh, ADMX, you have to be continuously analyzing and then feeding that information back in to decide whether or not you're going to rescan. Um, and this is because uh, with every run, you ultimately will generate some number of candidates just due to statistics. And most of them will just go away if you average more data. Um, and so our strategy basically is that we make a first pass through what we call a nibble which is basically a chunk of the frequency space. And we do so at a fixed tuning rate. Um, once we reach the end of that, we, um, we figure out our candidate list and then we rescan those candidates at a variable tuning rate. So going slowly over the candidates, but quickly over the rest of the frequency space. Um, if we still have candidates at that point, we do what's called a persistence check. So any axion signal would appear in every single scan. 
But if you have noise, it could be flickering in and out. And so if the candidate is flickering, we exclude it. If it's still there, we say, OK, let's keep going. Um, at that point, we turn to our uh, collaborators who do the blind injection scheme, and we say, OK, can you turn off the synthetic axions now? We um, would like to move on and um, check uh, again for persistence, but also go to uh, the site. And we wave a little antenna in the air and check to see if there's like a radio station that's interfering. Um, so if, that, if at that point there's still a signal, um, this is getting pretty intense and we have to move to more aggressive measures. And one of these is that we move to the adjacent mode. Um, so if you recall, uh, the axion only couples to this lowest order mode. So if you tune over to uh, a higher order mode, the signal should disappear. So this is another nice check that we have. Um, and uh, if it disappears, it's not an axion. If it's still there, uh, we approach, again, our blind injection team because it turns out that they have uh, just one more um, sort of card in their deck where they, they have these secondary synthetic axion injections um, that they could also turn off. So this is sort of extra stealthy of them. And um, if at that point the signal is still there, we take our most drastic measure, which is to ramp the magnetic field. So it turns out that the axon power scales like the magnetic field squared. So if you ramp it, you should observe this power scaling. So that, um, to me, that gives me actually a lot of confidence in our experiment. Um, and it's, it's not something that every dark matter search can do. So if you see this power scaling, you're, you can be quite certain you're seeing an axion. And at that point, you want to actually just study the line shape and get all this other information out of it. Um, but to just give you a sense of uh, what this looks like, I included some um, slides showing actual uh, examples. And uh, for example, if you want to uh, do a persistence check, um, you look to see if these uh, candidates disappear and reappear, as I stated before. And so here's an example. This was a synthetic axion signal um, that was present in all of our scans. So you can see the various scans are delineated by these red lines. And um, we saw the signal that kept appearing. And then basically, we asked our blind injection team to turn off the signal. And voila, it disappeared. So at that point, we knew, OK, this is a SAG, and this is not an actual axion. Um, and I want to note that typically, the time between the scans is maybe like two weeks or less. Um, so it's enough time for some rogue signal, if it's like a radio station, to disappear and, and so on. So. Um, this also can feed into our high resolution search, which looks um, to see at the effects of the orbital and rotational motion of the Earth. Um, finally, uh, as I mentioned, the blind injection team has what's known as secondary SAGs. And these are um, SAGs that they really refuse to turn off until the last possible minute. And so we had one of these examples lately, or, or recently. And you can see here, uh, very faint, but there's um, a candidate here that persists and it's in all of these different regions. Um, and so we decided to take the next step, which was to move to the adjacent mode. And so you can see this candidate in blue, it's on the TM010 mode. And in orange, it was on the, uh, this is the TM011 mode. And you can see actually it's stronger on this TM011 mode. So to us, that was a red herring that this is actually um, not an axion. And so we went to our blind injection team and we said, OK, uh, we think you're lying. We think this is actually a, a SAG still. And they said, yes, it was. Um, so uh, this, if this were an axion, the signal would just not be there at all. OK, so uh, provided you've excluded all your candidates, you're basically left with this grand spectrum. And you need to turn that into a limit plot. So how do you do that? Um, well, given a measured SNR, you find this value mu which corresponds to 90% confidence level, where mu equals g gamma squared times eta. And eta is the measured SNR ratio for an axion. Um, so then you can make a limit plot where you say at what level you excluded this g gamma parameter. And so this is um, basically uh, the sort of result you would get. I've 
uh, blurred out the current data taking run because this is not yet finalized, but you can see our the limit from our prior runs and you can get a sense of the frequency range um, with over which we're covering for this current run. Um, so if you're interested in the particular details of these prior analyses, I encourage you to check out this paper um, that is uh, was published in PhysRevD recently. Um, and then uh, moving on, I want to discuss these higher frequency regions shown in these pastel colors here. So uh, this is kind of pointing to the future. And so on that note, I want to explain what's called the Great Axion Search Challenge. And so uh, what I mean by this is that as we try to cover these higher frequency uh, ranges, we need to shrink the axion, um, the cavity volume. And what this means is that we ultimately have a slower scan rate, because if you remember our scan rate equation, the scan rate went um, as the volume squared. And so we need solutions to this problem if we're going to keep up the search. So the near term solution for ADMX is to coherently combine the power from multiple small cavities. Um, we have three such uh, multi-cavity searches in the near future. So first we have uh, run 2A, and then that's quickly followed by run 2B. And this will cover four point, uh, sorry, 1.4 to 2.2 gigahertz. And then beyond that, we move to what we call the two to four gigahertz run. Um, run 2A and B will be cited here at my lab at SEMPA. Um, this will be a four cavity array with a common rotor. You can see the CAD drawing here. Um, again, it goes from 1.4 to 2.4 gigahertz with a volume of about 76 liters and a Q of 130,000. And we have, uh, we will have a new upgraded quantum electronics package that we use. And this is important because in order to um, read out the signal, we need to power combine the four cavities. And this is actually not a totally trivial thing to do, but we have some uh, very good collaborators at WashU that are designing these Wilks Wilkinson power combiners that enable us to do so. Um, moving beyond that, we are uh, looking into uh, the ADMX two to four gigahertz run. And so this actually uh, has, um, we're not yet certain about the site at which this will be located, but we're looking into it. Um, it will involve uh, using a new magnet, and we're looking into um, making sure that it has both a high field and a large bore. Now, obviously, there's some uh, compromise between the two. Um, but uh, And you may think, well, high field is more important because the scan rate scales the speed of the fourth. Um, but a large bore is important, too, if you want to um, use that space to do any sort of prototyping or designing of new experiments. Um, so, uh, large magnets are hard to come by, so it's kind of a, an interesting trade-off. Um, we're also exploring, of course, new cavities um, insofar as we're looking into, for example, high TC superconducting walls with higher Q. Um, we have collaborators at Livermore specifically that are looking at coding um, these cavities with thin film superconductors. And then finally, of course, any sort of detector improvements um, that could help us boost the signal-to-noise ratio. So. Um, and in general, achieve better performance. So we're looking at, for example, digital combining of signals and then um, squeezing with the uh, quantum amplifiers. Okay, so, um, but then beyond that, the picture is a little less clear. So um, I am invested in uh, exploring new ideas with uh, our various collaborators. Um, one of the goals of future searches will be to make these experiments broadband. That is to say, it's um, if you continue tuning over these near ranges, you know, you're not going to cover this wide axion parameter space that I flashed on the screen earlier. And so um, in order to move to broadband searches, we're exploring the use of new technologies. So some of these are listed here, and I'll delve a little into a few of them. One is to look at new quantum amplifiers. So we're looking into these traveling wave parametric amplifiers, um, new types of um, piezo motors, uh, single photon counters, um, and then uh, FPGAs uh, for digitizing the data. Um, we're also looking into new ideas such as multiplexing cavities of different sizes, uh, broadband single photon counting experiments. And then finally, I'm involved in a project to use resonant feedback um, with FPGA filters. And I'll touch on that briefly at the end of my talk. 
Um, but basically, uh, the ADMX cavity actually is doing some current R&D. And um, the way we do this is we have a prototype cavity that um, historically uh, and currently sits on top of the main cavity. So we call it the sidecar. And you can see it in the photo here. Um, it's a small prototype cavity that enables us to test all these different um, technologies that we might use in the future. Um, so this current iteration of sidecar is testing these traveling wave parametric amplifiers or TUPAs, as well as a new design of the cavity we call the clamshell design. And then um, it's also testing the use of piezo motors, which we plan to use for multi-cavity runs. Um, on the topic of the first uh, bullet point here, um, I've been, uh, I wrote the script to sort of operate this amplifier in the current uh, sidecar data taking run. And um, one of the benefits of these types of amplifiers um, is that they can be uh, used for broadband experiments because they have gain over very uh, wide range. So you can see this is a gain plot showing the transmission measurement as a function of frequency. And you can see in blue um, with the, the amplifier turned on, you have gain going from about three gigahertz out to eight gigahertz. So that's fantastic. Our current um, amplifier doesn't do that. Um, that said, the noise performance is more or less the same as the current amplifier. It may be a little bit uh, worse, but um, this is certainly promising for broadband searches. And then um, I also just want to mention uh, a project that I've been working on um, that is tangential to Sidecar called the Resonant Feedback Project. Um, basically, uh, the idea here is that you, um, in a normal accent search, you have a cavity which provides high quality factor. Um, but if we, uh, what we want to try to do is to um, create uh, filters on an FPGA board and then um, feed that signal back into uh, the resonance structure here. And what that does is effectively uh, moves this quality factor out of the cavity and decouples the, the quality factor from your resonant structure. And so if it's successful, that would give experimentalists much more control over the detector structure. Um, so we're trying to demonstrate this on Sidecar first. So Sidecar actually does have a cavity here, um, but uh, once we demonstrate on that, we plan to test other resonant or other potential axion um, search structures here. And so if you're curious about this, my colleague Ada has put this um, paper, uh, he's published it in NIM, um, where he outlines a plan uh, to try this out. And basically, so the setup would look something like this. You have some open uh, or and or resonant structure um, where you detect your axions, and then the signal passes through an FPGA board that has resonant filters, um, and then gets um, propagated back into the um, into this cold region here where uh, the axion would be detected. And so we tested that with sidecar, or we're in the process of testing this with sidecar first. Um, and uh, one of the first achievements we had was to generate these resonances using the FPGA. So this is looking at a network analyzer and turning on resonances one by one um, on this uh, using the FPGA board. Um, and so this was successful because uh, because it enabled us to um, demonstrate sort of this broadband technique that FPGAs uh, would give us. And so I just want to thank uh, the whole collaboration because none of this would be possible without them. Uh, this photograph shows all of us at Fermilab in 2018. There's actually been a few people that joined since then, but we haven't had a group photo um, since the COVID lockdown. Um, so in conclusion, uh, the previous run achieved DFSC sensitivity over this range from 680 to 800 megahertz. Um, but the current run is seeking to exclude axions at 100% dark matter density from 3.2 to 4.2 micro EV, which is 780 to 1010 megahertz. So we're on track to continue our search for axions. We've been taking data throughout the pandemic. Um, and uh, discovery could happen at any moment. So, and as we stated, there is progress that's being made toward high frequency searches um, in the absence of a detection. So that's about all that I have. So I guess I just wanna say thank you and ask if there are any questions. Great, thank you very much for that 
fascinating talk. Um, do we have any questions from people? Please just uh, unmute yourself and, uh, and ask away. see anybody um, I'll um I'll, I'll kick things off um, could you go back to your you had a really nice plot where you uh, sort of tantalizingly obscured your most recent result um, there's yeah there's a, there was a lot on there that I, I'd like to right that's a busy plot <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's great so you I it's good it's cool that you've got all of the different um, axion mass predictions on there um, so I mean, what, what I, I'm, I'm sort of curious about how you sort of prioritize these um, different regions, because I mean, obviously you've got, you know, various, um, you know, experimental ideas that you, you want to try and to, and to move up to high frequencies. But things like, um, you know, you've, you've got this nice DFSE sensitivity um, in a sort of small mass region. Um, but then for this most recent one, you've kind of skipped over the end of the ADMX 2010 KSVC sensitivity to move to, to that mass rate. So what, what's the sort of like kind of decision making that goes on the collaboration sort of decide where you're going to you're going to do your your runs? Yeah, so um, this is uh, yeah, so this I realize this plot is actually a little bit confusing. So um, we did blur this region out. So basically the solid colors are showing what we've already done. And so we've already scanned over this region. We actually plan to continue down to here. Um, I guess the blurred region could have gone out to there as well. But um, so we do plan to match up with the run 1B um, endpoint here. Uh, but there are a couple other gaps, like you'll notice here, for example, and that's due to our mode crossing. So I've meant I mentioned I think before where uh, if you kind of have those two modes intersecting on that mode map, um, it becomes difficult in it, it's tricky to track which mode you're on and then you also your form factor um, is diminished and so it becomes hard to fill in uh, the data there that said with the given run we actually realized we can we have the ability to scan down that low so we're going to try to fill that in uh, this time um, as far as uh, other parts of yeah frequency space so i guess these are just all uh, you know these are all undetermined right now because that's in the future but that's the range we plan to hit. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, I've always wondered this because I, you know, I look, I look at these limits, and they're all sort of, you know, you've gone for certain frequency ranges in some places, but I guess it's a, you know, complicated task. I mean, you, you know, when you have with these mode crossings, are these the sorts of things that you could go and fill in at some point, just with yeah. experiment? <laughs> I think everyone's always worried, and myself included, that it's like, what if the accent is right there, and that's <laughs> where you missed it? But so. Yeah, we um, it, it, it depends. So like, I think we got lucky with this run. I think the components that we're using enable us to get down that low. Um, but sometimes it's just like, there are some very narrow mode crossings in here. You can't see on this scale, but um, you the problem is because the components are so frequency dependent, like the amplifiers and such, um, sometimes, you know, like your sensitivity will cut off like right as you get close to them. Um, and so it's not always possible to fill it in. I know uh, ideally we would want to go back and fill everything in, but um, it's sort of a question of like, what's what's the best approach? What will maximize our chance of finding it? <laughs> and the parameter space is so wide. Um, sometimes it seems the best thing is to just keep looking. Uh, Bruce. Yeah. Uh Hi, excellent talk, thank you. Sorry, and I'm not looking at you because I'm looking at the big screen. Let me just bring you over. Um, just for a relative outsider, can you remind me the like yellow brown lines on the plot in the QCD axion strip? Yeah, so Names, uh, like are, Theros and so on. Yeah, these are theoretical predictions. Okay. So, so these are not experimental limits or anything. Um, these are where people think the axion might be. <laughs> Pardon me, on the basis of what sort of arguments in general? Uh, that's, yeah, that's specific to the papers. <laughs> I'm sorry, okay. I'm not familiar yeah. with all of them exactly. Um, yeah, so I guess, 
Sorry, it's really specific to the papers. Okay, and did I understand from the discussion with Kieran that there are there are cases where the frequencies of different modes in the cavity cross and you lose the ability to, to measure the axion in a particular cavity, that was the point? Right, yeah, so um, I, might, I can go back to the plot here. You can see it when I, I play this. Um, if you look at some of the modes, when they get very close together, um, it's that's when you have a mode crossing. And so yeah. it's basically, we have to track where the mode is at all times in order to be able to make a good measurement. And you can't at that point. Um, and the reason why we have to do that is so that we understand what is our quality factor and how well are we coupled. Um, and so also to do the whole, like to tune, um, because we have to know it's sort of this incremental process and you have to feed the frequency back in. Um, so you, some of these previous experiments appear to have, you know, just small excluded regions because of this. You didn't report that. So is that because you have more sophisticated tuning possibilities available to you or? Um, or no, or we actually, we do have that. So I don't, I can pull up another plot of ours that's zoomed in. Sorry, I'm going back to the one I had before. Um, so this is so zoomed out. Yep. that you yep. can't see it, but I we see, do have exclusion, like there are very narrow bands in here that are not filled yep. in. Yep. Okay, hence the discussion about going back to, going back to cover them again with different equipment or, or such. Right, right. Okay, thank you. Can I ask a question? I don't know how to raise the hand here. Uh, uh, Chelsea, thank you for, for a very nice talk. Um, yeah, well, I mean, uh, to, to, to say about this, uh, I, can, I can say a little bit about this uh, heavy mass predictions for, for the axion, uh, the question Bruce had before. Uh, this is really related, uh, as far as I understand, uh, uh, with, with uh, assumed modification, uh, ultraviolet modification of QCD. And, and the contribution from the small instruments and things like that. Uh, otherwise, that window which you indicated uh, for the standard QCD, uh, you know, is, is, is I think, robust. Um, so my question was, um, so you, I see that, uh, you know, the sum of the things are colored here, uh, you know, for, for the future sensitivity of ADMX4 and so on um, in, in that plot. And uh, how confident would you be if you, um, uh, if you fill those gaps uh, completely. So can, can we talk about that the QCD solution to the strong, you know, the axion solution to the strong CD problem is that? Um, um, well, I, not up to, let me see. Uh, so the mass range that I had quoted before was one to a hundred micro EV. So I think we can, go a little beyond that, uh, you know, we have plans to go beyond that, as I mentioned in the like later slides. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, you do get to a point eventually where you, I think you have excluded the whole QCD region. Um, so I mean, there is a lot of interest. So like I showed in my previous slides, uh, there's a, a lot more experiments that are joining this field. And some of them are just interested in general in axiom, like particles that maybe don't make up 100% of the dark matter density. And so there's interest in continuing to look for um, axions, just not the QCD axion at that point. So, yeah, I'm not sure it's- Yeah, I understand easy. that, but the theoretical yeah. motivation for that is, is uh, weaker, obviously, right? Um, as far as I understand it, yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yep. Um, Uh, I might just ask one last question. So, um, I mean, on, on the subject of the fact that this is a, a wide parameter space that requires a lot of time to, to exclude even a, a tiny frequency range, um, how, how much contact do you have with some of these other um, 
kind of cavity collaborations. So like the the Korean, the, the Cap One and uh, Haystack, and I think maybe there is a few more. Because um, I yeah. mean, probably the, the most straightforward thing is for everyone to be kind of going out this parameter space at once so that you can kind of deal with these kind of, you know, issues with gaps and mode crossings and things like this. Um, so do you, do you yeah. sort of speak regularly with, with these other collaborations? Um, I guess it depends on what you mean by regularly. Like we do talk to them. Um, you can obviously see like, for right now, it looks like, you know, we're in a different frequency range, but eventually we'll be encountering these similar regions. And we just had the, um, what do you call it? The snow mass uh, meetings, um, which is, you know, for funding high energy particle physics in the US, but also our collaborators in other countries are participating as well. And um, at that point, there was a lot of discussion. So we were like interacting with CAP and Haystack and trying to figure out, okay, what's the long-term plan? But uh, recently, like on a day-to-day -day basis, not so much, um, but yeah, it'll probably definitely come up as we move more to higher frequencies. Um, great, so I think I will stop the recording there.